The goal in this video is to do uh, a broad introduction to the nervous system. And the nervous system is an unbelievably complex system with many, many different organs. We've got sensory receptors sending information back to um, nerves that go to the spinal cord. Um, that information winds up in the brain, gets processed, integrated. Uh, some of that information gets ignored. Some of it gets sent down motor systems to contract muscles, uh, make heart rate change, um, increase breathing rate, affect your kidneys. There are just so many things going on here that we have to start off by dividing it into sort of categories that we can deal with. The first way that you can divide up the nervous system is anatomically. So CNS and PNS, right, central and peripheral nervous systems. The idea is uh, the central nervous system is contained inside of a cavity and they share a fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. And so we say that the brain and the spinal cord make up the CNS but there's nothing magical about this. So when you go from the spinal cord out to a nerve that leaves it and goes out to the body, nothing incredible happens. There's still neurons. They're still sending the same kinds of electrical signals. You still see synapses and neurotransmitters. It's just that the CNS tends to be contained within a certain body cavity. And in general, the CNS acts like an integration center. And that term integration, you can really just think of as a, as a fancy word for meaning processing or thinking. It's just that the thinking isn't always conscious, right? A lot of the integration that the brain does is unconscious. It's monitoring your blood pressure and oxygen levels, uh, movements that involve balance and stability that you don't really think about, you know, which muscles do I contract to not fall over when I walk up and down a flight of stairs, but your brain is integrating that information under the hood all the time. The peripheral nervous system is really just carrying the information to and from the central nervous system to make things happen. And so the PNS is taking care of both sensory input, which is where all of our nervous system activation has to start. If you didn't have sensory input, then your brain would effectively just be moving blindly through the world, having no idea what was going on around it, but we take in information about light and sound and temperature and touch and all these different stimuli, um, as well as internal stimuli like blood pressure and oxygen levels and how full is your stomach. All of those sensory inputs get sent from the PNS, right, either through cranial nerves or spinal nerves. Those are the two ways that the PNS can send information um, in and out of the brain. That PNS sensory info is always going to go to the CNS, get processed in some way and interpreted. And after you've integrated that information in the CNS, you have two options. Um, option one is to do absolutely nothing because a lot of information needs to be ignored, right? Your brain shouldn't be responding to every possible stimuli that's going on in your environment because you know even the feeling of your shoes on your feet when you're going throughout your day that sensory information is hitting your skin and going up the spinal cord to the brain at all times. But most of the time, your brain says, well, that doesn't really matter. Unless something happens, you get a rock in your shoe, you have a blister that hurts, you can ignore that information most of the time. Whenever you can't ignore it any longer and it needs to be dealt with, that's when we have a motor output. And motor output means we're just causing the activation of some kind of effector organ. Um, and effectors can be muscles, like skeletal muscles to move joints, could be cardiac muscle to change your heart rate, it could be smooth muscle that makes your um, stomach contract to push food through the GI tract, or it could be glands like sweat glands or salivary glands, or um, adrenal glands that secrete hormones like epinephrine or adrenaline. And so you have many, many different possible outcomes. Okay? And we can further subdivide this um, using a flowchart system. So just to clarify, this flow chart is not really showing you anything anatomical. It's more a way for us to organize the different parts of the nervous system and label them. Okay, so in this setup, sensory information, we call that the afferent division because afferent always means leading toward. And so we say it's afferent because the information always goes back toward the CNS, right? If you're heading back toward the brain, it has to be sensory, and we can subdivide it into two further parts, um, somatic and visceral. All right, somatic information, you can mostly associate that with meaning anything coming from skin. So that would be touch, temperature, pain. 
and visceral meaning anything from internal organs, right? Your viscera, think stomachs and intestines and livers and spleens. They send lots of sensory information that you might not always be aware of, um, but when sensory information back to the brain telling it that stretch receptors in the stomach have been activated, right? Because you um, had too much food and the walls are stretched out, right? So you send that information via the peripheral nervous system. It winds up in the central nervous system where we're going to start integrating that information and deciding what to do about it, right? Once the brain has decided what to do, the answer, right? If the answer isn't nothing, that information has to go back through the PNS and now we're going back out a motor division, right? On the motor side of things, we have another set of options. On the motor side, somatic means voluntary, anything that you can do on purpose. And as wild as it is, most people have never really thought about it. The only muscle, or sorry, the only organ system that you can voluntarily decide to contract um, is skeletal muscle, right? No other organ. You can't just sit there and make your kidneys filter more plasma. You can't sit there and make your stomach decide to contract or your heart rate to go up and down. Um, skeletal muscles are the only organ that you have voluntary conscious control over. And so we say that's somatic. The autonomic nervous system is effectively the same exact concept as visceral. And so in sensory, we said visceral. In motor, we say autonomic. They effectively mean the same thing. Uh, when I hear autonomic, I think automatic. These are things that are happening involuntarily. You have no control over them. And so think heart rate and um, baseline breathing rate. I know you can override the lungs, but if you're not thinking about it, your brain sets your breathing rate, contracts smooth muscles in your GI tract, um, controls how much you sweat. Uh, nothing you can do can voluntarily overcome that, right? And then within the autonomic system, right, we have two subcategories. Um, the sympathetic division is often called the fight or flight part of the nervous system. You should associate everything going on with the sympathetic nervous system with epinephrine, right? Remember, epinephrine and adrenaline mean the same thing. So everything that you associate with an adrenaline rush, faster heart rate, faster breathing rate, sweating, your metabolism goes up, blood pressure goes up. Um, the most sympathetic things that you can do are like, you know, running from a bear or escaping a burning building, right? All systems go. The parasympathetic division is the opposite of that. A lot of people call it rest and digest. So um, digesting a meal, sleeping is probably the most parasympathetic thing that you can possibly do. And so parasympathetic side of things will increase the activity of GI organs, right, for digestion. And these two, to some degree, are in competition with each other. So neither one is ever 100% on or off. They just have a push and pull relationship where they inhibit each other. And so if you get more sympathetic activity it tends to suppress parasympathetic and vice versa. Okay. So use this as um, a general outline going forward to keep track of which structures belong to which categories. The one thing that I'll note is not on here. Um, we did not mention special senses at all. Um, special senses are um, vision, hearing, taste, and smell. Um, those sort of fit into their own unique categories. They target unique parts of the brain. Um, we'll deal with those when we get to the PNS. All right. So now that we've got that basic information down, let's talk about structures um, in a neuron. So neurons are very unusual cells, right? First, they're absolutely enormous. Um, the largest neurons in a, a person's body can extend all the way from their brain to their lower back and then lower back all the way to their feet. So for a reasonably tall person, um, that can be a three foot long neuron. And the setup is these neurons are built to form connections. This cell body or soma, which is just where you find the nucleus of that cell, has many little processes coming off of it. And these processes on the cell body end of it, we call dendrites. Um, dendrites are 100% receptive, meaning they're taking information in. And so when you see that this is the axon of another neuron that's somewhere off the page, its cell body would be over here. This axon is sending information down this way and sending that info into these dendrites. So the connections between axons and dendrites, we call synapses. 
And those synapses are communicating information into the next cell. And of course, there would be many, many other axons coming here forming connections as well. They're just not being drawn. So you have tens, hundreds, sometimes even thousands of neurons making synapses with these dendrites. And the entire purpose of this cell body or soma is to integrate that information, right? Think of it kind of like a boss sitting in a meeting that's asking hundreds of employees for their opinions on things. But at the end of the day, the boss is going to make the decision as to what happens. The same idea here. All of these synapses are coming in, connecting to these dendrites and sending information in. Um, sometimes that's positive, like excitatory information, and sometimes it's negative inhibitory information. But at the end of the day, the cell body right here is going to make a yes or no decision. You're either going to send an electrical signal down this axon or you're not. Okay, And so think of that cell body as doing the integration function that we talked about before. It's integrating, right, blending together all that information from dendrites and funneling it into the axon to decide, do we pass that information down the line or not? Okay. For somewhat complicated reasons, uh, neurons tend to live a very long time. Um, the neurons that a person has once they're a teenager are the same neurons that they're going to have for the rest of their life. They don't divide. Um, they only die if there's a trauma of some sort. And the reason for this is a neuron is defined by the connections that it makes. And so if someone has a stroke or has a trauma and this cell dies, um, theoretically, you could make another neuron divide and try to replace the one that was dead. But if you can't make that neuron form the exact same connections that it had before, it's not going to be the same neuron, right? It's like taking circuits from a computer chip and cutting them and rearranging them. It's not going to be the same chip and it's not going to work correctly. And so when neurons die, we don't really even bother having them uh, be replaced by other cells that divide because there's no instruction set that's left behind to tell the brain how to remake those connections. All right. And lastly, while neurons are alive, they have an enormously high metabolic rate. Um, the brain is about 2% of a normal person's body weight, but it uses about 20% of its oxygen and glucose. And the reasons for that will make sense in a later video when you see that neurons have to use an enormous amount of ATP um, to generate the electrical signals that they do. All right. Another difficulty that neurons have is transporting nutrients up and down their cells. So axons can be incredibly long. And this, um, this is actually a video that if I was able to press the play button right now and bring it to life, you would see these little beads, these little glowing dots. You would see them start moving up and down the axon. Um, those are vesicles. And neurons, in order to be able to function, they have to be able to transport nutrients from their cell body down the axon to the axon terminal. And then they also have to be able to transport waste products back up the axon to the cell body to be removed and eliminated and processed. And so this idea of axonal transport really just means that um, you have to be able to move nutrients and waste products up and down the cell. Enterograde transport means you're moving things away from the cell body. So these should mostly be nutrients that the end of the axon needs to function. And retrograde means you're bringing things back towards the cell body. So these would be any damaged or defective organelles, um, proteins, anything infectious that needs to be recycled um, by the cell body um, to remake new molecules. All right. Okay, next point to clarify. In the picture that I showed you before, um, we were looking at a multipolar neuron. Um, this is typical of the CNS. Um, central nervous system neurons are multipolar, which really just means they have lots of dendrites, but only one axon, right? And technically, it seems like this should count as more than one axon because it branches at the end. But we say that it's only one because there's a single axon that actually stems off of the cell body, right? And so multipolar neurons, one axon, many dendrites, this many number can be anywhere from a few to a few thousand. And almost everything in the CNS, whether it's brain or spinal cord, um, fits that category. The reason is the goal of the neurons in the CNS is to integrate information. If you didn't have multiple inputs, right, dendrites, what would you really be integrating? 
because the term integration means you're taking an information and you're trying to come to a conclusion from it. You can't integrate one thing. It's not possible. Okay. That's why neurons like bipolar neurons, which are pretty rare, but we are going to see them in the eye because they're common, common in the retina. They have one dendrite and one axon and the dendrite sends the information in and the axon continues that outgoing information down the line, but we don't see them very often because they're effectively just um, linkers between other cells, right? And so think of um, another cell type over here that gives input and then another cell type down the line here that receives that information. The bipolar just connects the two and we'll see that when we get to the eye. Unipolar neurons are even stranger. They have their cell body segmented off to the side, and they don't really even have um, any dendrites at all. This structure really acts like one big long axon, and you have an input end, and then you have um, another terminal on the other end that's gonna connect to uh, another neuron down the line. These are almost always sensory neurons. And the reason for that is the axon really just acts like a wire. So over here, you can imagine having a touch receptor, right? We saw those in the skin. If you have a touch receptor cell that gets activated, um, it stimulates this axon to send that signal into the spinal cord, which is where you would find the other end of that neuron. But the cell body has nothing to do with actually sending those signals. It's all about the touch receptor. And so you don't need a bunch of axons and dendrites because this neuron is really just like a wire that's sending that sensory information from point A to point B. Okay, so going forward in this section, when we talk about neurophysiology and synapses and action potentials, I'm going to focus on multipolar neurons because that is the vast majority of neurons in the nervous system. And then when we get to examples where unipolars and bipolars are actually seen in practice, we'll talk about them a little bit more. All right, okay, that's the end of this video. The next one is going to cover um, the neurophysiology of membrane potentials, moving ions back and forth across membranes. That's what's going to allow us to do electrical signaling. So follow an order in the playlist, um, subscribe to the channel to make sure you have all the videos. They make the most order or the most sense when you watch them in order.